moderator for today's session. I just want to introduce uh, Karina McDowell, who is the founder and garden manager of the Sugar Grove Davis Community Garden uh, here on the northwest side. <laughs> and I didn't know if you just go pee or come on in. Oh, I'm sorry. Go right ahead. Come on in. Um, and she's also the food access chair of the Northwest uh, Area Quality of Life Plan. And then we also have Jim Wu, who's ready for putting this stuff together. He's with <laughs> Sustainable Local Foods, which is an organically grown um, food provider um, that repurposes buildings in neighborhoods to, and then grows organic food on a commercial scale. And they have just um, recently launched here in Indianapolis, um, but you can get their products at Kroger's and Myers and Whole Foods and Green Bean Delivery. So uh, he's doing things on a, a bigger scale, but uh, also working within our neighborhood. So first, our free. Hi everyone. Hi. Hi. Um, like, is, like she said, I am the founder and uh, garden manager for the uh, Shepherd Road Davis Community Garden. Uh, a few years back, I've been having discussions with neighbors who were remembering raising their way for the community, who remembered uh, all the gardeners that used to be in the community that are gone now. And then the opportunity presented itself through the uh, Mayor's Front Porch Alliance and Growing Indy for me to start a community garden. At that time, my backyard was becoming a tourist destination for the neighborhood kids. My uh, grandsons would bring the kids around to the backyard to look at my raised beds and my chickens and the compost bin. Um, so this was an opportunity. I found a site that is right across the alley from School 44's, Riverside School 44's playground. Uh, quarter of neighbor site, and the city has graciously given me a free lease for five years, uh, as in addition to other resources. Um, in that time, we've started uh, uh, working with School 44. We bring classrooms out. Uh, this spring, we brought the kindergartners out, we read the legend of the three sisters, and then painted a three sisters bed. Three sisters, of course, are corn, whole beans, and squash. Um, now, most of the produce in our garden is given away. I work primarily with the under 10 crowd, which is a challenge in and of itself because I'm answering more questions than we're getting worked at. Uh, so, my garden's always weedy. If you can't find a sand, you'll probably find a lot of weeds. That even that I find presents opportunities because I define the weed as a plant that's simply out of place. <laughs> and you'd be surprised how many of those weeds are actually out of I am teaching my the, the kids in the neighborhood that mulberries are not poisonous. That running past and but snagging a perfectly ripe strawberry or raspberry is a perfectly acceptable snack. And kids that garden tend to eat more fruits and vegetables than the kids that do not grow because they plant it, they grew it, they get excited about it. Um, now, some of the things that I've noticed working with the quality of life, just living in this neighborhood, which is a big desert, the number of food deserts that they've got in the community. How many of our jobs have simply gone away over the past 25 years? And with that, we also have a rise in crime and violence, and our kids aren't doing as well in school as they used to. Um, people are leaving. Part of the reason that uh, for some of this is mom and dad are both working. So the kids, once they reach a age where mom and dad think that they no longer need babysitters because it's expensive. These kids are latchkey kids and they don't have as much to do as they should. Uh, community gardens are one way that you can not only teach math, science, literature, 
but get them excited by doing it. Give them supervised activities to do this. Uh, and it also is a great way to reconnect with our neighbors. And on my block alone, the people that live at my end of the block, we all know each other. We're always talking to each other. But at the other end of the block, there's a bunch of uh, uh, vacant land and houses. At the other, other end of the block, they don't know each other at all. Because they're fairly new to the community and they don't talk to each other. This is one way to create those connections that also help reduce crime and violence because you know each other, you know who belongs. Uh, community gardens with our kids involved also helps with all of these issues. Um, and with the jobs loss, transitioning to market gardens, once people know how to grow, if we transition to market gardens, there's at least a new income stream there that will help. Uh, these are some opportunities in the uh, upper left-hand corner. Those are kindergartners planting the three sisters' beds. Hmm. But you can have harvest festivals of some sort, pigeons in the garden. Um, Winnie roasts. Even in the winter time, there's the possibility of sugar maple. Or, how many of you have ever had real sugar maple syrup? There's quite a few that haven't. It's not that difficult to do, but it'd be fun to try. Uh, first thing you need to do, talk to your neighbors. Find out who's interested. Form a committee. I'm telling you right now, one adult, 20 kids, and six tools is a recipe for disaster. <laughs> <laughs> when you choose your site, be sure you get the soil testing done. In detail, has a lot of, and I've got handouts here with some of these resources, but Envy Tilt has a link for the Safe Urban Gardening Initiative. They will test the soil for free. Uh, if you contact the Mayor's Front Porch Alliance, they can help also help get the uh, soil testing done, help you uh, get a lease, if you don't know who owns the property, get on the city's website and you can look it up. Uh, if it's owned by the city, there's a possibility you can get a lease for it. All of these things you need to do before you can even get started. One last thing I recommend, prep your beds well ahead of time. In my garden, there used to be a house. When it got torn down, it actually got dumped into the basement and then covered over. They had pink toilets. Uh, <laughs> I also do not have to buy bricks because I keep finding them. Uh, I also ask everybody that comes out to the garden to hold on to the marbles because they keep losing them. Uh, <laughs> now, one other problem I've been, our kids don't know what spores are. That's child neglect. Yeah. <laughs> um, Purdue Extension has a lot of resources on their website. Again, if you go to indy.gov under the uh, community re neighborhood resource tab, there's a link directly to the uh, extension office. They've got articles, they've got pamphlets, many of them free that you can go in there and get more information on gardening. If you want to grow something in particular you've never grown before, quick web search can help you find a lot of information. The library gives you a lot, has a lot of resources. Uh, one book I just checked out that I found very interesting is called Paradise Lot. It's about two gentlemen in Holyoke, Massachusetts that bought a devil and they have created a food forest on this property so that they can literally walk out of their back door and pick fruits and vegetables for a good portion of the year. Uh, again, Rowan Indy, they have a network of gardeners. Not only will they help you with uh, uh, securing city-owned sites, they'll help with soil testing, they will provide some resources and provide you with a growers network. Uh, and the American Community Gardening Association also has a lot of tips on starting a community 
Bloomberg. And again, on my hand out here, I've got them addresses. Uh, don't forget about your neighborhood gardeners, the ones that are there. They are a great resource and they're a chatty group. So you'll find out everything you need to know. Your neighborhood seniors, many of them did have gardens when they were younger and they would be more than happy to help you. They won't do the work, but they'll tell you how to do it and tell you when you're doing it wrong. <laughs> and of course, area schools and other neighborhood of organizations. Are there any questions? Let me just say that we will hold, um, have plenty of time for questions at the end. So if you take, think of something, make a note so you can remember. You're going to get both extremes today, and I'm 100% favor community gardens. I'm not a community garden. We actually are the opposite extreme from the perspective of uh, our, our, our goal is uh, to try to create as much uh, supply as we can in, in a local community to offset the food that's coming in from other places. So our goal is actually not to become big ag, but to compete against big ag by the affiliation of basically being able to produce to quantity. And so what we do is we actually, and I'm going to stop for a minute. How many of you in here believe you're biased? <laughs> I'm extremely biased. Um, everything we do is based upon our, our life experiences. So I was a prison chaplain. Uh, that, that, that's one of the reasons I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I'm doing. I was a prison chaplain, but I also had a couple of other careers. I owned up a company that did services for people with mental health and disabilities for a long time, a fairly large company. And I did vocational rehabilitation. I actually was a state director of vocational rehabilitation in Ohio for a while. And so one of my biggest concerns was employment, especially employment for individuals re-entering the community, employment for individuals with disabilities, people with historic background issues. It really used to piss me off that I'd make a lot of money trying to find jobs for people who couldn't get jobs because they had historic background issues. And I always, I love urban areas. That's, I lived in Los Angeles, so that has a relevance because I'm very familiar with California and I'm very familiar with what's going on in California, which is why I do what I do right now. I became pissed off at the fact that that no one was trying to solve this problem for urban areas. There were people with historic background issues and nobody was doing anything about it. There was a lot of money going towards trying to create jobs or find people jobs that didn't exist in industries that either were on their moving out or were shutting down. So I'm a weird guy. <laughs> and you have to be a weird guy to do what I do. But I, I about six years ago, I ran into a paper that was done in Ohio called Ohio Farms, but you also have one similar to this. If you are interested in food at all and have not read this paper, it's called Who's Your Farmer by Ken Nutter. You can get it online. It will change your life. It's 129 pages, so this is not an easy read. But Ken Better, is, he's out of Minneapolis, and basically, I read this paper and it changed my per entire perspective. He basically said, what, in essence, paraphrasing it, what's wrong with us? Why are we produce, purchasing all this food from outside when if we just did it internally, we could solve not only the food situation, we could solve the economy. In Indiana, Indiana, 14.5 billion dollars, billion, on an annual basis, 14.5 billion is consumed in Indiana, and 90% of that comes 1,500 miles away or more. 1,500 miles away or more. Now, a few years ago, I sold my company and it took two years to just figure out how to do what I'm doing. I'm not, I am a farmer. I wasn't. I said, why can't we do this in the Midwest, in Detroit, in Toledo, in Cleveland, in Indianapolis? Why can't this be done? I, I get the whole climate thing. But the truth is, the truth is they're doing this all over the world. This is nothing new. We're just not doing it. 
So I took a lot of time to figure out what were the best systems, and we're still playing with that. But how this ties into neighborhoods is this. We either do what we do and convert the neighborhoods, or the mega farms will do what we do, and they'll do it someplace else and send the food in, and that doesn't solve the problem. We have a resource in Indianapolis that is incredible. It's called empty buildings <laughs> and vacant land, which a lot of people say, are you nuts? No, I'm, well, yes, I am, but. I'm excited. I'm Why can't we all be nuts about this? Every one of those buildings, and what I'm saying about is not easy. There's nothing easy about farming. There's nothing easy about what we do. So this is not me telling you, hey, jump on this because it's get rich quick and it's easy. I'm saying if we don't do it now, we will have to do it, by the way. It will have to be done. California is an illusion that's about to go away. And people don't get that. They are seriously diluting themselves. They have no water, and you cannot grow plants without water. They have poisoned their environment to the point of no return because they collapsed their aquifers. So even if they got rain next year, and El Nino came in, and everybody was out in the streets jumping up and down, where is the rain going? It has no place to go anymore because they've collapsed their aquifers, which is God's sponge. It's gone. It will go into the oceans. And if it goes into the oceans, then they have to turn on their desalinization plants. And as soon as they turn on their desalinization plants, what happens? The price of produce goes like this. So what I'm trying to say is, it takes a weird person like me to basically say, we need to wake up right now, collectively as a community, and we need to do what's in, right in front of us. We have empty buildings. Every one of those neighborhoods with empty buildings could benefit if that building was filled with something that was not only productive but healthy to the community. We are not going to replace the manufacturing that left. We are going to replace it with something better because it's not an illusion. If you grow food within your community, 15 years from now you're still growing food within your community because no one's taking that over to China or India or any place else because it's a part of your fabric in your community. So what we do is we come into communities and basically work with the communities. Sustainable Local Foods Indiana is an Indiana-based community and some of the members of Englewood Community Development Corporation or Englewood Church and community are here. They're part of our group that we established initially in Indiana because the idea would be that it should be done through Indiana, by Indiana, in Indiana, hiring people from the neighborhoods where we put the sites in. That's really what it's all about, right? Local food is local food. Not a company coming in and putting a brand on something and becoming a mega farm. It's establishing basically an affiliation of local farmers, understanding that the, if we don't aggregate, we lose. It's an aggregation of local farmers with a real outcome. We put one small facility in Toledo and we had Kroger, Whole Foods, and Myers beating their door down. I didn't recruit any of them. They recruited us. Because they desperately needed local food that could be given to them year round. Now, I will 100% tell you that in my heart of hearts, some of what I do, I don't believe in. <laughs> okay? What's that mean? <laughs> you know, I, 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 if I had my way, if I had my way, you know, we were talking about celebrating seasonality of produce, right? If I had my way, I would love that we produce produce in different seasons as it was designed in certain <laughs> geographic areas. But what I do is basically say, listen, all these places are getting tomatoes year-round, and they're getting cucumbers year-round, and they're getting peppers year-round. And you don't want them from Mexico. I've been there. Any of you who ever purposely eat an organic tomato from Mexico, I just want to 1,000% tell you that one of the primary organic ingredients in Mexican tomatoes is human waste. Just so you know, 
The sludge farms in Mexico City is the primary, basically organic substance that's sprayed on those fields. It's sludge. Human waste. Completely organic, by the way. <laughs> and it can be used safely. Right? We couldn't agree more. As a matter of fact, if any of you, I'm, I'm not going to give away a secret here, but any of you seen the movie The Martian? How cool is that, right? <laughs> And, and I have no problem with that because it's an organic situation, but the problem is that Mexico doesn't actually have any kind of health regulations. So it's not like the sludge is actually treated because it's not. And a dirty little secret that nobody seems to ever talk about is the fact that anything that comes into the country, into the country from overseas, is regulated by the FDA. How much do you think the FDA actually inspects? What percentage of fruit per produce coming into the U.S. do you believe that the FDA is required to inspect? Anybody know? Would it surprise you to find out 1%? 1% of all the produce outside the United States coming into the we're required to inspect 1%. USDA, anything grown into the thing, is about 70%. Any food coming into the country from outside the country, 1%. the opposite beyond if you actually go and again this isn't speaking ill of third world countries because the agrarian situation is critical for their survival but there's in many countries there's absolutely no regulation so pesticides aren't regulated uh, fertilizers aren't regulated it's critical for food safety but it's critical also for the fact that we need to use it to spur an economy in the inner city the reason I selected food production is nobody asks the historic background of the grower. You certify your process. You certify your food. That's what you certify. You get GAP certified, so you're using good agricultural practices. You get Prima certified, so you're using basically food safe practices. And the growers can be the growers and they don't get asked, what did you do when you were 18 years old? Because it doesn't matter. All that matters is what are they doing now, right? Most of the people that I've dealt with in my life, and I'm, most of the people I've dealt with in my life have come through significantly, historically awful upbringing. And what they need, more than anything, is hope and opportunity that is real. You have 1.8 billion, million, 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 1.8 million people in the Indianapolis metro contiguous area. 1.8 million. Just think about the fact that if every one of those persons consumed one head of lettuce a week, which isn't that astronomical, right? I'm just, 1.8 million people consuming one head of lettuce a week. Do you realize that would completely change your community? Completely, from an economic perspective. If it was grown here, raised here, consumed here. I can guarantee you, based upon figures that are happening right now, that on average, there are 1.8 million heads of lettuce being produced, consumed on an annual basis in your area, through the restaurants, the grocery stores, the hospitals, the institutions, the schools. I can guarantee you that almost all of that is being coming from California, Mexico, or someplace other than here. We can grow that here. We can repurpose buildings in your community here. When I say we, I use a community collective we. I am a for-profit corporation. I get that. You have to be a for-profit corporation to play in the world that I play in have to. We partner with not-for-profits because we believe that the only way a for-profit corporation can keep its soul and its mission is to have not-for-profit partnerships because money is the root of all evil. <laughs> the love of money. The love of money. Thank you. Thank you. Money is important. Because I love money. <laughs> Money's important. As a for-profit corporation, we need to be profitable. As a for-profit corporation, we need to be efficient. I use, significantly, we use science and technology. 
Our systems are actually the most modern systems on the face of the earth. We use LED technology that was designed by the cannabis industry. We do. We have lights that a smartphone can actually adjust its light recipe at any moment of any day. They actually have a sensor to tell you how much sun's coming, so I could put a light recipe saying, this is for this plant, this is what it gets in June on June 21st, and I can program that light recipe into this LED light, and in January 15th, it will get the same amount of light that it gets on June 21st. Mm. We replicate environment. We manipulate environment. We do it organically. I don't make any excuses for that because for us to grow year round, the only way we can play in the, the world we play in is I have to be able to tell Whole Foods, Kroger, and Meyer that they're going to have a crop every week, every week, and that crop is going to be a certain yield and certain quality every week, right? So we replicate an environment or modify an environment. What, what we're trying to basically I'm trying to, today is basically, you know, the title of the, the thing that was, you know, basically food for the future, right? Fuel for the future. The future is that we take advantage as a community, right now, the resources we have, we invest in it as a community. Our goal isn't to be the large sustainable local foods having all these sites all over the community. Our goal is to start with the mothership kind of model and then hopefully have 100 to 150 or 200 independent folks doing the same thing and we aggregate our resources and we basically allow these other stores and hospitals whatever to realize that they don't have to purchase any longer from Indiana or, or excuse me from California or uh, Ecuador or Venezuela or any other places they're getting because we can grow it all right here this isn't pie in the sky stuff. Many of you have gone to Disney World and seen Epcot Center. So have you ever gone into a food exhibit at Epcot Center with their hydroponics? That's exactly the systems that we use. Hydroponics, real briefly, is basically using, uh, we use the exact same thing that's in the soil, exactly. We use a media, and we put nutrients in that media that the same that the plant would get from the soil. So it's not like, weird growing science and anything like that. It's, it's, well, we use science and technology so that you always have a pH blend, you always have your DC levels, you always know what nutrients are going in. But it's, it's basically giving the plant the same thing that it gets naturally. The problem we're basically trying to do in Indiana and Ohio and some of the other places is we're trying to combat what's a variable that none of us can predict, which is climate, right? The hardest thing we have going from a door, somebody asked me, you know, are you opposed to growing in the soil, not at all. Um, I'm helping right now to develop a 120-acre organic farm in Upland, Indiana. I love everything about it, everything about it. The problem is that when they're growing organic corn, which I love because they feed it to their livestock, which I love, the problem is it takes a long time for that to grow. And it just doesn't have a lot of cost effectiveness. So if we could blend these systems together, so that the good that they're doing and the good that we're doing can kind of augment each other, and uh, then it gives them more of an opportunity to do what they do. And we believe in that. We believe that we can help a lot of the community gardens and local farms here by creating a, a market for them that they can grow in, be a part of, sell to. We believe that can be a benefit situation. And I think, so what we're proposing and suggesting quite honestly is Neighborhoods can change, but there has to be focus, and there has to be action. The day of talking about this is over. It has to be done. And I'm not just saying it. I put everything I have into this, everything I have into this. I mean, I'm, I'm, way, I'm way out of the boat on this one. I'm way out of the boat. But you all as a neighborhood and community have to be the same way. This is not something that a company can come in and do. It's something a community has to do. I was explaining a little bit earlier, and this is an important situation here. I was explaining earlier that, uh, you know, I can't compete. I can't compete against an 89 cent head of head, head lettuce that comes from California. I don't want to. 
because the only way you produce cheap produce is you exploit the plant and you exploit the labor. That's the only way it's done. There is no other formula. I can be competitive, but I can't compete against it. So if the community doesn't see the value in me paying prevailing wages to our workers and see the value in us making sure that our plants are actually given healthy nutrients and allowed to mature in a natural, healthy way, then I'm dead. But I believe there's enough people in this community that will see the value, not only in what we do, but other people do, and say, okay, we understand it's going to cost a little bit more, but it's going to cost a whole lot more if we don't do it. And so what we're trying to do is get the community to understand, you know, support this, work with us on this. Uh, we want to work with the community on this. And, and you know, we started out at the East Washington Street, uh, which I love that neighborhood, by the way. We're in Twin Air. Yeah, everybody warned me about Twin Air. <laughs> I love everything about this community. It's just the coolest, the coolest place, right? Uh, the history of it. Um, but there are other, I've had the, the privilege of being introduced to other neighborhoods throughout Indianapolis, and I've had the privilege lately of being shown other buildings. Uh, one of the things, you know, I get a lot of people now call me up and say, hey, somebody donated a, a warehouse to us, can you come over and take a look at it? And um, here's, you know, 20 acres or 24 acres that got torn down, and can you do something with that, and that kind of stuff. We may not be doing all of it, but we could prob pro probably work with the different community organizations on figuring out how to do that, how to make those things work. Uh, the reality is it's, it's, it's worth it. The reality is it's worth it. So, uh, you know, somebody asked, and I'll, I'll close with this on this and then we'll take questions. You know, what can you grow? Almost anything. Almost anything. We can grow hydroponically. I mean, almost almost nothing that you can't grow. So we have grown about... 25 different varieties of stuff. So we'll grow tomatoes, we'll grow peppers, we'll grow cucumbers, we'll grow eggplant, we'll grow varieties of lettuces, collards, mustards, chard, any kind of herb. But you can also grow things like carrots, you can also grow, I mean just about anything can be grown. Some of it you have to augment or suck, because not all of it grows fast, right? Can I, I can grow watermelons hydroponically. It just takes a while, right? So if we put them on the bottom of our, we grow vertically, so we do vertical growing. So I take that bottom space and I plant watermelons underneath our vertical growing and it takes them, you know, 60 to 65 days to mature. Don't really care because it's really not taking up prime space. It's taking up secondary space. We just have to think differently. All of us have to think differently about how to use the space. Even in the community gardens, we have to think differently about how to use it. Uh, what's the smart use of... And community gardens are essential to the community. I mean, any healthy food... Any healthy food... And, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know, because you, you, you wouldn't be here if you weren't part of passionately believe in neighborhoods like I do. You know what happens to a number of children on a daily basis that live in this community. You know, a lot of them have never seen real healthy food. The fact that we live in a country where people go, help, go hungry is unconscionable. The fact that we can do something about it and don't is unconscionable. It is unconscionable that we have food deserts in urban areas. It's unconscionable. We believe that we, collectively as a community, can deal with this. It's not easy, and it's not quick, but it's the right thing to do. And we'll commit ourselves to the city of Indianapolis to help in any way we can to change the food. And I apologize. I'm a little bit passionate about this. Amen. 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 So. Please, if you get a chance, read this paper. Uh, this is Ken Matter, Hoosier Farmer, Emergent Food Systems in Indiana. I gave you a couple pages of a summary of my thing. Uh, you care at all about food systems and, and 
this is just this is a, a life affirming paper that can help you when you're talking to others, especially politicians. Oops, I hope this isn't me. I didn't say politicians. Did it? <laughs> <laughs> I did, yeah. I did that. <laughs> especially when you're talking to people of influence. <laughs> on how critical it is, how critical it is that they actually understand the nature of the, the issue and the fact that they have an ability to do something for it. So thank you very much. I think what? Uh, yeah. Um, so you said that you can grow almost any fruit or any uh, thing that can grow? Sure. Could you grow a coconut tree? You could. The, the, the issue becomes, again, what's the wisest use of space? You can actually, and actually it's, it's actually being done right now, believe it or not, in, in Ohio, in Dayton, Ohio, a guy actually has bananas being grown hydroponically. <laughs> oh, yes. Wow. The question becomes a matter of what's the best return on investment for the space and the resources. Um, there's a day I want to play with a lot of things. The biggest concern for me right now is just getting crops going that people need right at the moment. But yeah, you can grow bananas, you can grow almost anything hydroponically. Um, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon was, was it was completely hydroponic citrus. So this is 3,000 year old technology, by the way, 3,000 year old. Hanging Gardens of Babylon was completely hydroponic. So everything about that, because they had no soil, okay? So basically they formed bricks, I mean troughs, and everything was basically done through irrigation and they used, in essence, to be quite honest, a lot of what the Hanging Gardens of Babylon did was exactly what I just said. They actually used manure. That was actually one of their main fertilizers. So they actually recaptured their own manure from their animals and that was actually what they used as nutrients for it. So this technology, we, we just put a little, it, none of this could be done without LEDs. I'll, I'll be honest. The reason, see, why is this possible now? It wasn't done before. You couldn't have done it because of cost factors. LED lights are so energy efficient that you can now basically provide uh, the, the light that it needs at 85% um, energy efficiency of what you could have done 10 years ago, and soon that's going to raise. Um, I'm a huge believer in energy efficiency. I'm a huge alternative energy guy. I mean, huge. Anything I can do with alternative energy in our systems, we do. We're hopefully going to, in this new building, it will take us a couple of years, but they had a hot water boiler system, and most of you know those aren't really efficient, energy efficient. And I'm hoping in a couple of years to actually put a digester to it and reuse it, but using a digester to actually power it, right? I mean, it'll take us a couple of years to get there, but the, can you imagine if you could basically use a hot water boiler using a digester? Mm -hmm. And we're going to use solar panels on the seat on the we have a sawtooth roof which is perfect for basically solar paneling so we're going to tie solar panels in there so our leds are powered by it. but if you can mitigate your energy cost with the, the light situation then you know you can produce it at about the same cost that you're currently basically by the time you take transportation in you're, you're almost at the same cost that it's bringing in from california and in two or three years, because of what's happening in California, we'll be cheaper in two or three years than California produce. And then you own the market. <laughs> but you have to start. Yeah, I'll take questions. One more. <laughs> no, go for it. Um, so, what, like I heard like a, U, a UV light, or what's, what's better, UV light or LED or CFL? Well, UV is actually not what you want. You actually want to mitigate your UV. Um, uh, when you're using UV light, you actually, UV light's primarily, its primary fo focus in growing, the UV part of it, is actually more of a deterrent for, uh, you use it to deter basically bacteria and algae growth, UVs. Mm -hmm. uh, you're using LED light because plants primarily uses far red and blue. Most people think that these white lights, the old hothouse, do you remember the old hot house things they had there? It was just a disaster, right? Because they, they put in these, these high pressure sodium bulbs, which mm -hmm. primarily produce white, bright white light. Well, plants don't, plants only absorb 3% of that, and that's only the green spectrum. What a plant mm -hmm. primarily needs from a standpoint of what it's actually ingesting, it needs red and blue. That's what it, it basically red gives it its growth, and blue gives it, its, for the most part, I mean, I'm being a little bit simplistic here, but Blue give it, gives it its grit. 
So when you have a bright white light in there, you've wasted almost all that light because the plant's not adjusting it. It doesn't want it and it doesn't need it. So you focus your LED specifically on the lumens, the spectrum that the plant actually needs for its pathological growth. And that's what you basically, and that's what LEDs allow you to do. Yeah, you call yes. It. How does the light, um, when you're growing in kind of chronic way, I don't know enough about it, but, sure. but as far as the nutrition standpoint of it, does it, how is it compared to putting it in a garden versus growing yeah. it, you know, what, where is the nutrient factor, like how does it compare? The actual yeah. nutritional value. Well, it would actually be higher because you have a higher concentration of nutrients going into it. It's actually higher. So we we do um, we use Clemson University, and maybe there's a university here that does the same testing. We use Clemson as our testing for our plant tissues. We do BRICS testing. You know, all of you are familiar with BRICS testing, where you basically the natural sugar levels that come out of a plant. Every plant produces its own natural sugars, and that's how you know its health and its taste. So we actually do bricks testing to make sure that the plant has actually naturally sweetened itself because that's really critical in quality and flavor of the plant. We do plant tissue testing to make sure that the nutrients that are supposed to be in the plant are what's in it and you all, but it actually has a higher concentration. So while lettuce in and of itself is not a tremendously nutritional plant source, right? I mean, I'm not telling you, hopefully I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Uh, if, in our, in our romaine and, and our, our bib lettuce, you'll actually find that it will actually have a high nutritional concentration. One of the reasons I love microgreens, microgreens have a huge concentration of nutrients. So if any of you are familiar with microgreens, has everybody had microgreens? We do a lot with microgreens because it's just full of nutrients because you basically only grow them until they have a, a cotyledon stage. And, and at that point, you haven't dispersed all the nutrients to the leaves, so they're actually concentrated. On, and and uh, so they not only have a lot of flavor to them, but they actually have a huge nutritional value to them. And so we try to educate people as much as we can on the fact that they have to think differently about what the plants produce. I harvest it when it's in its highest nutrient content. Once we're at full scale here, we'll actually base our harvesting schedules on the time of the day that the plant is at its optimal point in its bricks level. So we'll actually harvest it when it's at its optimal point. And, and, and the only way you know that is basically to do metrics. So when it's at its highest point, that's when we'll actually do our harvest. But we will harvest on a weekly basis. We'll actually probably have three harvests a week when we're in our optimal situation. For, for a head of lettuce, I have about a 26 day turnaround from um, when it's put into a channel or a, a plant position to when it's fully mature. So we can actually do probably 13 to 14 uh, heads of lettuce in one plant position over the course of a year inside a building environment. So if you take, a, let's say you were talking about you were talking about acreage, acreage. If, if, if I'm planting out um, 40,000 square feet inside the building, it really is the equivalent of about 15 to 16 acres of production in that 40,000 square feet situation. So from a production standpoint, you're getting about 16 acres worth of produce out of that 40,000 square foot section. Now, can you purchase your food now from the grocery store? You can. Uh, you can. I, I'm putting a disclaimer on it, okay, because it's the food that you're currently getting in Indiana is coming from Ohio. It's coming from Cleveland. And I don't mean that negatively. It's coming from Cleveland, and while it's completely healthy and good, it's not organic because the Cleveland operation isn't organically certified. And just because they, they use a rafting system there in Cleveland, I'm not trying to get off the tangent here. It would be impossible, impossible for me to organically certify a rafting system. Impossible. So what we've done here in Indiana when we're going through our process, we're actually using what's called a nutrient fluid uh, technique. It's a, new, a drip system uh, in channels and in buckets, which, which will allow us to actually control the nutrients inside that particular plant space, which will allow us to grow organically. So we're actually taking Indiana is going to actually be an evolution over what we're currently doing in Ohio. This will be the first organically certified hydroponic operation that I'm familiar with in the this area. Uh, well, we're, we're, we're fitting out the. the I, I think I handed you out that. We're fitting out a building that was a, a old, uh, those of you familiar with York Heating and Air Conditioning? They used to have a warehouse in Twin Air. It's by 
Washington. So we're actually fitting that out right now, and um, uh, to so we, we have some production going in modified situations, but. When we're done, we'll have about 40,000 square feet of grow space that we'll be doing there on that particular site. Jim, uh, you kind of alluded to it earlier. Um, you, how can neighborhoods get one of these production facilities in their neighborhood and employ their neighbors? Well, mm -hmm. uh, quite honestly, the, and, and, and again, don't misunderstand what I'm going to say here. I would love, over the course of the next few months, not because you necessarily even use sustainable local foods, don't misunderstand. But I would love if the neighbor, different neighborhoods had buildings in their, their area that they'd like us just to come and take a look at and assess and then meet with their community organization folks and just talk through what's the best way to get this launched. I would love to do that with the communities. And again, not because I'm special, it's just this just happens to be a passion of mine. Um, so it may not be sustainable local foods production facility, you may have an organization that's got the wherewithal and readiness to do it, and we can just kind of help give you the design and help get things going. But our, our goal would be to try to make sure, in Indianapolis, there needs to be seven or eight of these production facilities over the next three years for us to have the kind of impact on the food system that actually takes notice and gets things moving. And that's just the reality. And, and your uh, email and phone are, is on the handout. It is. It, it is. And, and, and again, um, I've had an opportunity over the last few months to meet a, n a number of organiz community organizers and, and, uh, and some of the communities, I mean, I know this is going to sound funny, but when I went to East Washington, and, and I know that that's a community that desperately needs revitalized, but I'm, I'm, I'm used to working, I worked in Detroit, <laughs> and I worked in Toledo, <laughs> and so some of the neighborhoods I worked in, uh, so somebody said, how bad can a neighborhood be? I've seen neighborhoods where there was about a 75% vacancy rate, right? Um, and and, and I, I don't think there is such a thing as a neighborhood that's too bad. I think you have to be wise about how you go about it. You know, first thing when we were over there and I, I'm telling them how we're going to retrofit this and they said, well, you know, we covered up all the glass because it kept getting busted out, right? Okay. So you put in a double pin shatterproof poly, polycarbonate, right? You're still getting light translucency. It doesn't shatter. You don't care. Throw a rock at it. I mean, you do what you got to do, but eventually when that, that building starts producing value to that community, there's no more rocks being thrown at it. People have to basically have to earn trust. And once you earn trust, the community will support you. They'll protect you. I grew in Toledo, Ohio in a gang neighborhood with LED lights that are used to grow marijuana in a greenhouse that had no security whatsoever and not one light was stolen and we didn't have security at night because we had a relationship with the community. And I promised them that if they would protect me, I would protect them. There's a question. Yes. How much success have you had with employing people with hard disease? And you want to define historic backgrounds, historical background that euphemism you use? I, I use it to be nice. Um, most people that we work with have had, most, not everybody, most people we work with have had run-ins with authorities. And a lot of the folks that we have worked with in urban areas you know, they've came, come up through neighborhoods where even if they didn't want to, it was just a right. And I mean, it's just a fact. I mean, I'm not telling you anything you all don't know. So you didn't want something that happened from 14 to 16 or 14 to 18 to interfere with what now happened when they're 22 or 23 and they want a new start, but they can't get past the stupid thing that happened when they're 16 to 18, right? Um, I work with a lot of folks that have mental, had, had mental health issues. and. So they might have had a meltdown. Um, particularly, I'm very interested, uh, because I used to be a prison chaplain, uh, and I'm an old guy. So I was a prison chaplain back in the day when reentry wasn't reentry, right? I was a prison chaplain and back in the day when I used to go before judges and convince them to try to let this guy back in the community and say, well, how are you going to assure me he's not coming back in? <laughs> well, what we try to do now is basically convince people that because there's a plan and we work with community organizations 
to, to support them. So we're not the end all. All I am is an outcome for a job, right? But you have some wonderful community organizations that do great wraparound services, which is why you want to partner with your community organizations. So that when that person's employed by you, they're also getting wraparound services by other people to make sure there's a potentially healthy outcome. But, so we work with people that have substance abuse issues. That's not an uncommon situation. I, I have a particular bent towards the individuals coming back from overseas who have not only the PTSD, but also unfortunately we're trained in skill sets that don't easily transfer here in a positive venue. So you try to create an environment where someone can come in, have a sustainable, decent job, and also basically learn and have an opportunity to learn how to work through some of those unstable times in their life because if we, and, and I'm dysfunctional, okay? I mean, from the perspective of, every, all of us are dysfunctional. We just don't like to admit it, right? <laughs> We're all dysfunctional. So you try to create an environment where if somebody has a moment of dysfunction, they don't lose their place in line. They don't lose their career. Because in urban settings particularly, that happens too often because people view people in urban settings as fodder. They look at the next one up and they don't care. So as soon as somebody has an issue, they get kicked out of line and they have to go way back and start all over again. And that just makes that person that much less willing to go the next time. So if you can create an environment where if that happens, they're not out of line and you support them, then you continue to go forward. I created this for-profit company 100% for the purposes of creating jobs, which is really oxymoronic. Because business's main goal in business today is to eliminate jobs. So I actually purposely created a company to create jobs. I totally get how oxymoronic that, no that notion is. I actually care about employees, which is the converse of what the current business market is. But having said that, Employees then have to understand that if they're getting that second chance, they have to think about the next person in line and they have to do what they're supposed to do because they're responsible for the opportunity for that next person in line. So in our culture, as we hope to create it here, it will be a situation where whoever gets the second chance, they're getting a second chance for the next person that needs a second chance. And that will be the standard that we hold them to. I am a person, again, I'm a, I'm a flawed person, but I'm a person of faith. And I believe that the only reason I have an opportunity is because somebody did it for me. Yes, sir. To prove that we believe in you, the logo for your product is on your shirt. Is yes. that the logo? It is. And it is wholesale Whole Foods and what other uh, outlets? Uh, Kroger, um, Myers, and, and Whole Foods currently. So pretty much any Kroger store in Indiana, Annapolis, would carry this. Uh, when we're producing in Indiana, it will actually be a higher quality product than what we're producing. We have a high quality product out of Cleveland. I'll be quite honest. We just can do it better. I, 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 we can do it better. And I'm always aiming towards, our goal will always be to have the highest quality produce that you can grow. I mean, that's, the goal is always to be better. I'm sorry. Corinne, I wanted to ask uh, a question. Yeah, you sure. had, um, I know this because I, I uh, vacationed this summer in the, the Finger Lakes district, and you used, you referenced the three sisters. Yes. And I think that's an early way of sort of, um, kind of, some of the things that, that Jim was talking about, how you can maximize your space, um, co co collaborative nutrients, I mean, written, fascinating concept to me and it's been around for a couple thousand years. Do you want to talk about it's it? It's kind of, it's a com companion planning. Basically with the three sisters, they work because corn provides the, the support for the pole beans. The pole beans fixes nitrogen into the soil to feed the corn. Hmm. And the squash kind of acts as a living mulch. It's also a little bit prickly and the raccoons don't like to walk through it to eat the corn. Mm -hmm. um, and there are other synergistic uh, or companion plants. There's a lot of books out and a lot of information out. I've brought some books with me that have inspired me. Parents love tomatoes. Books like this will tell you what to plant with each other, not only to benefit, to, uh, to mutual benefit. 
I'm telling you, it's going out to where it goes later. Uh, but are mutually beneficial. But uh, also, when you interplant, then it helps deter pests. So you have less use for chemicals. Compost everything. My daughter-in-law swears that I put my vegetables on steroids. Because <laughs> um, and I, I lasagna garden. As a matter of fact, I'm about to build a lasagna bed with the help of uh, students from 44 so that they understand the, the whole cycle of what happens. Does everyone understand what a lasagna garden is? No. no. Lasagna, it's also called sheet composting. Uh, start with a layer of car cardboard or newspaper, and then just layer straw, leaves, kitchen waste, manure, and if anybody in your neighborhood raises rabbits or chickens, you've got plenty of it. And just keep layering it until it's 18 to 24 inches high. If you do it in the fall, which is the perfect time, by spring it comes down to about 12 inches. It's perfect. It's a perfect growing medium. And by doing it that way, if there is a contamination issue, Assume, if you're inside the 465 loop, assume that you've got some contamination. <laughs> uh, but if you do have a contamination, by having that layer of, and, and you can call the right tree service, they'll dump truckloads of mulch. That's a barrier method so that you no longer have that contamination issue in the road. Yeah. In Rodrigo, the Three Sisters restaurant, that's where their name comes from. Probably. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. On the back of their menu, it used to have the story of the Three Sisters. Mm -hmm. Hey, Jim, can we tour your operation? Um, we will be able to. We're just finishing some environmental uh, fixes to it because when you. It's in 465. It's in the 465 loop, <laughs> and, and, and you're right. Everything within the thing just has to have a little tweaking done to it. Um, but we certainly will be having kind of an open house for the neighborhoods to come through because again it would be our goal once uh, it, it's kind of in play so we, we think by the first of the year we'll be fully planted and and fully ready for it um, but uh, we do have again we do have two two systems currently operational and soon we should have the whole thing done are there ways that community gardens can kind of start playing with some of what you're doing if there's not like an organization that's kind of ready to go into that with them? Like, are there ways they can? One hundred percent yes. Um, there's different types of hydroponic systems that actually integrate well with community gardens. They're not necessarily extremely efficient from a production standpoint. But they're extremely efficient as far as growing. So the. Um, we would be happy to work with community gardens on how they can integrate some simple hydroponics in their current system. Um, and uh, yeah, the answer to that is yes. How approachable is the city um, for property that they own that is a eyesore in a neighborhood that we can just convert to that community if garden? They, if they own it, they are very approachable. Okay. Uh, contact uh, the Front Porch Alliance. Doug Harrison is the director. And they what are looking for that again, Doug Harrison. What department? Uh, Front Porch Alliance. And. Is it on here? Yeah, it's on here. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's uh, because I got it, uh, went onto the city's website. It's a fairly long web address, but it is on this. Uh, they want to. The 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 okay. Uh, but they are very approachable that, like I said, they will test the soil for you. They'll give you a five-year lease. What I would recommend, though, if it's a dump site, okay, because my garden, where it is now, was a, a dump site. I'm still finding broken shingles. I'm in my third year now. I'm still finding broken shingles and pieces of the toilet and stuff like that. Sifters are super easy to make. And not terribly expensive. I've got one that I made with half inch hardwood cloth and scrap two by books. Yes, it is labor intensive. Getting the kids there, you can get through it. Um, and you can literally sift a lot of the, the large junk out, but you cannot sift out contaminants. When you say they'll lease it to you, are they charging you to clean up their. Okay. No, so you just have a legal document. Look at 
you're you're helping the city by occupying space, turning a space that was an eyesore into a, a positive community right. area. Okay. So it, right. it's interacting with them. Everyone wins. The city has someone who pays attention to that spot, and the neighborhood has a place that cares and has a way to interact. With I think the girl and also, you purchase. You can also purchase the lot. Are you talking about through the land bank? Maybe. It because you can, can but we've oh, had issues with that. And it, they might be owned by someone else. So right. you but if it's owned by somebody else, you can also trade maintenance or a basket of vegetables or whatever for use of it.